Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in another uh, episode of Arab American Identity a podcast. And uh, with us is Dr. Hani Bawardi. And Dr. Uh, welcome again in the Dearborn blog uh, um, podcast about uh, Arab American Identity. Thank you. Uh, this is our second uh, recording uh, uh, of of this uh, series. We don't uh, know exactly how many episodes uh, the series will take. Uh, we are continuing the conversation with Dr. Hani Bawardi uh, around the topic of his book, The Making of Arab Americans from Syrian Nationalism to U.S. Citizenship. Today's topic is going to be more focused on uh, the Arabic identity, not the Arab American identity, but the Arabic identity, uh, that which the early immigrants have immigrated to the U.S. with. Uh, Dr. Hani Bordi's book, um, again, the title is The Making of Arab Americans from Syrian Nationalism to U.S. Citizenship. While conventional wisdom points to the Arab-Israeli War of 1967 as the gateway for the founding of the first Arab-American national political organization, such advocacy in fact began with the Syrian nationalist movement, which emerged from immigration trends at the turn of the last century. Bringing this long, neglected history to life, the making of Arab Americans overturns the notion of an Arab population that was too diverse to share common goals. Tracing the forgotten histories of the Free Syria Society, the New Syria Party, the Arab National League, and the Institute of Arab American Affairs, the book restores a timely respect of our understanding of an area then called Syria that compromises modern-day Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, and Palestine. Hani Bawardi examines the numerous Arab American political advocacy organizations that thrived before World War I, showing how they influenced Syria, Syrian and Arab nationalism. He further offers an in-depth analysis exploring how World War II helped introduce a new Arab American identity as priorities shifted and the quest for assimilation intensified. In addition, the book enriches our understanding of the years leading to the Cold War by tracing both the Arab National League's transition to the Institute of Arab American Affairs and new campaigns to enhance mutual understanding between the United States and the Middle East. Illustrated with a wealth of previously unpublished photographs, the making of Arab Americans provide crucial insight for contemporary dialogues. University of Texas Press, 2014. And I hope that all of the listeners interested in this topic to... Uh, get this book from Amazon and read it while you are listening to these episodes so you will actually have uh, a more in-depth insight into the conversation. If you have any questions for Dr. Hani Bardi for the upcoming episodes, please do uh, ask them through any uh, of our social media sites or website. You can find us at dearbonblog.com or any other sites that have, uh, are publishing this podcast. Dr. Hani Bawardi, um, today's topic is, a, is of a personal importance to me uh, because it is one of the questions that I've been contemplating for a while now. Um, I understand very well having an, a background in Islamic studies, the Islamic identity. It is a very solid, clearly defined um, supported by uh, texts that are very well preserved. Um, it has a definition for its geography, for its values. The, the Arabs from the uh, Arabic Peninsula who were taken by Islam and, and spread across uh, the, the old world at that time uh, merged their Arabic identity with the Islamic identity. After the fall of the Ottoman Empire, you have an emergence of a neo-Arabic identity, if I may call it. Um, I feel that it is one of the least defined uh, things. Even uh, discussions I've had with other uh, Arabic thinkers, it seems that there is a lot of 
uh, question marks around the definition of an Arabic identity. So I want to start with this question: What is the what is the the Arabic identity um, as you understand it? Um, hello, everyone, and <clears throat> Wassam, thank you very much. I am very very appreciative of you taking the time to address those issues and to talk about the book, of course. And um, I wish more people felt the urgency to revisit what it means to be an Arab because without that conversation it would be nearly impossible to arrive at a conceptual framework of what it is to be an Arab American. So with that, you know, times like this I'm wondering how far back in history do the listeners want to go and of course if we go too far back it becomes more conjecture than historical fact. So let me stick with what we know. What we do know is that the most reliable marker of what it means to be an Arab is the language. And Arabic was referenced by Egyptians uh, as far back as 1800 BC, which is pretty old. Uh, they are uh, referred to as uh, desert dwellers who transport water from place to place, uh, very proficient at it. So, Arabism then predates Islam and Christianity, uh, just the same. However, Islam, which we'll talk about, we should t take these things maybe one thing at a time. Islam, as we all know, overshot the area, geographical areas where Arabic is spoken. So, Arabism, Arabic language, Arab narrative, poetry, collective memory predate Islam. However, Islam uh, extends well beyond the Arabic realm. With that, so people spoke Arabic well before uh, the birth of Christ. We know that because one of them converted to Judaism about a thousand years BC. So you have Arab Jews. They did not speak Hebrew. As a matter of fact, no Jew uh, spoke Hebrew in antiquity. They spoke um, the language of the region, um, Aramaic for the most part, that's what Christ is believed to have spoken, or Arabic. So they were Arab Jews, but also non-Jewish non Arabs dwelling in, from Yemen to all parts of the Arabian Peninsula and beyond. So, and then uh, some of those became Christianized at the hands of the apostles, according to their tradition, the Ghassasana, Tagalba, Tagalbites, and Gassanite tribes pride themselves on being, you know, Arab and Christian. A uh, famous tribe is uh, Al-Kindi, um, a mystic or an author, prolific uh, poet, poets like, for example, Umr al-Qais, uh, who believed to have authored the most expressive line of poetry in Arabic language about the horse. Uh, was a Christian. And in the vicinity of the early Muslims, the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and forgive me if I don't always say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace upon him, because I want to project uh, myself as a historian um, um, first and foremost. Uh, but there were Christians in Western Saudi Arabia, in the Hejaz region, uh, when the message spread, preaching, um, the word of the Quran. So two questions, doctor, before sure. we proceed with Islam. Um, when you say that there were uh, Arab Jews, that there were um, Arabic uh, desert uh, dwellers, uh, 800, 1800 BC, how are they defining them as Arabs? Is it by the language? Because of the language, but... <clears throat> This is much too early to have a cultural or um, a collective identity. So, because is the Arabic language that uh, that old? Yes. Is there an estimate of the age of the Arabic language? Yeah, because there there are references to Arabs and their language and their habits and mm -hmm. some of their practices by the ancient Egyptians, and those are among the oldest civilizations. Uh, 
in the region at least, well, I don't want to ignore what was happening in Africa or or the Far East for that matter. So right. um, to give, uh, you know, due attention to other geographical areas in the world, but combine those, you know, Mesopotamia mm-hmm. in modern day Iraq and the ancient Egyptians between them, they laid the foundation for what became later on as Western civilization. But the region is the birthplace of those religions. So it's important to um, make space for Arabs and Arabism and their language in that region since antiquity. Um, I, I need to interject something here that the listeners might find useful. In Western discourses, especially in the United States, Arabs, their language, their history, their, their literary output were written out of history entirely. They are overlooked. They're overlooked in elementary school education. They are non-existent in college education. Uh, The Americans, on average, don't know much about the ancient Arabs, for that matter, the contemporary Arabs. So that should be mentioned. So they refer to Arabs as they kind of roll their history into Islamic, uh, what they call the caliphates, uh, as if it's some abstract, exotic thing that a fleeting thing, whereas uh, the Arabs um, can trace themselves to the Canaanites <clears throat> with some precision. Uh, Canaanites dwelled in this area of historic Palestine, for example. The ancient Arabs uh, make references to Yemen as a source of their culture. Um, Qahtan is their father. Uh, Canaan is their father in the uh, Syrian regions, and including historic Palestine, for example. And so there is continuity and there is contiguity to their cultural memory that was put down on paper pretty early on. All of it awaits translations. All of it awaits sufficient attention uh, on the side of the Atlantic. So Germans and uh, less so British, who came later on, and the French, paid some attention to these stories, but frankly, the classical Arabic language is very difficult and impenetrable to Westerners. A few, maybe Roger Allen in the United States and a few others, more so British and German uh, scholars, understand classical Arabic or, you know, at least journalism Arabic. Uh, You don't find not even a handful of people who do in this country, the United States, which is a huge, huge um, shortcoming. Um, It creates uh, this penchant for ignoring all that history because simply no one gave it any attention. We know it. We read it. Uh, We know the poetry of Umar Umar al-Qais, which was trans, uh, you know, preserved through oral histories. In fact, the only record, the only, you know, uh, the, the basic record of the Torah itself came from oral tradition. Um, the same is true for Arabic poetry before Islam. How do we know so many poetry, uh, poems, for example? Mm-hmm. I think Antar bin Shaddad is, uh, uh, they call them Shu'ara al Jahiliya or uh, Jahiliya is a word that describes pre Islamic period. Um, pre-Islamic poet, poetry is well preserved and celebrated and foundational for you know understanding who we are. I had to memorize the Ma'allaqa, the poem of Amr al-Qais in my advanced studies of Arabic. Sure. So it's still considered a reference for... Uh, yeah, yeah. we used to call it Nahu and Balagha and we used to call it uh, nuclear physics. Yeah. This was the hardest <laughs> class we... Yeah, rocket <laughs> yeah. science. <laughs> Um, so, Doctor, we, we got into uh, the time of Islam, the, the 7th century, um, and uh, the emergence of, of Islam, which carried the, the Arabic with it, uh, and it has expanded in a very fast uh, period, over the 100 years, over you know the uh, one century after uh, the death of the Prophet, 
you have Islam reaching all the way to China, uh, going uh, east, and to the Atlantic going west. Uh, how did that, you know, influence the the t- formation of the the Arabic identity, the propagation of the Arabic identity? Now that the language is an official language for the religion. Yeah, well, um, we should state um, clearly that the Christian Arabs remained as is. They just kept speaking Arabic, kept worshipping you know, Christ, and uh, their religion is an extension of the Torah, which is, I mean, Christ came to start a new chapter, and uh, hence Christianity. So those guys dwelled... We, many historians think they are descendants of the Nabataeans who inhabited this area of Petra in, in the Jordanian desert, etc., etc. But when Islam came... It reinvigorated both Christianity and Judaism because it did not challenge their teachings. Uh, there are differences, some are fundamental, but Islam and Christianity share entirely too much to be at odds. Muslims believe in the virgin birth, for example. They believe that Christ walked the earth and that he was a great prophet. Uh, they don't believe that he was crucified. Uh, of course, if they did, they'd be Christians. So, um, that's the only difference. Uh, whereas in Judaism, um, Judaism by definition does not believe uh, that Christ is the Messiah. And, and you know, uh, in any case, so when Islam came, uh, it actually the the language of the Quran started or ushered in a new chapter in. Arab literary history, because the Quran is considered one of those miracles of Islam. The Quran is expressive. It's um, uh, it really is a joy to read for anyone who understands the language. I don't want to pretend to be a, an Islamist or a Muslim or you know a, a pious person myself, but in my native tongue, when I read the Quran, it is an experience. I think all Arabs can attest to that. So there is that. So you have al-Jahliya, Adab al-Jahliya, or the literature of pre-Islam, um, it has a different tone, color, uh, veracity than literature that came after Islam. In addition to the Quran, you have extensive conversations between the Prophet and his inner circle of friends, what is called in Islam al-Sahaba, um, companions. Uh, referred to companions referred to as hadith. Hadith means conversation. But those conversations were expounded on and studied and explicated, which gave us a tradition all it, uh, you know, all its own, called fiqh, or you know, Islamic jurisprudence. That actually expanded the boundaries of Arab literary tradition in itself. So, for example, I have the oldest, one of the oldest documents I have belongs to an arch priest called Basilius Kherbawi. The man is an Orthodox priest. He's Christian, but he's also an Arab. So he has a handwritten manuscript of some 1100 pages that explains the, um, the grammar, the Arabic grammar. And he does it in the classical way. And it reads like hadith almost. So, uh, Muslims explicated and explained the grammar of the language based on um, small stories on, uh, or anecdotes or examples. That became Nahu later on, or like an advanced or elevated level of, of the language. But here's a Christian doing the same thing. What does that tell you? It tells you that Christians who were Arabs were influenced in a profound way by Hadith and by Islam. In fact, I'll go as far as saying, and I hope we'll talk about this at some point, the Mahjar literature or the uh, literature of the diaspora. Uh, the Prophet uh, by Jibran Khil Jibran, which sold more than any book in history, uh, reads like, unfolds like Hadith, frankly. It has all those, you know, um, humanism woven into it. That's what the Hadith does. It became an integral part of the Arabic language. So the Quran, Hadith, and pre-Islamic Arabic tradition 
all intertwined to give us a new um, run of, of spoken and written Arabic. And of course, you know, putting the Arabic word down on paper is also very important, which began, became a common practice even before Islam. But as you know, we have copies of the Quran that date back to the period. I mean, within 50 years of the message itself, there are two copies of the Quran that we that I know of. Other scholars might actually have more information on this. Uh, one in Timbuktu was found more recently, and an um, earlier a German archaeologist, I think, found a copy of the Quran in um, in Yemen, which is only within 70 years of the message itself. So it's we know the Quran is, uh, the text is static. It has not changed. It was not altered, or at least should not have been, or, or may not have been. Also, there is a, an, an oral memorization of and, course. Uh, uh, from one generation to the other that uh, uh, the Arabs, like you said, it, even the poems have uh, transferred from one generation to the other, uh, preserved due to their uh, emphasis on oral history. But um, uh, nevertheless, there is talks about you know uh, changes, uh, minor changes or uh, edits. Uh, you know that can we can leave that for a separate discussion. Uh, so, doctor, um, the so now we have uh, Islam is expanding. Uh, you have Islam uh, in North Africa. You have Islam in Spain. You have uh, Persians who have learned Arabic and they've written in Arabic. Um, Turks who have learned Arabic and they're writing in Arabic, and you have uh, the uh, advance all the way to the second Abbasi age, where the you have the Mamluks and you have all these small uh, kingdoms that are emerging and and uh, disappearing uh, with all kind of different nationalities, but one commonality which is Islam and Arabic. And then you have the Turks coming and the Ottomans solidifying, consolidating power, and you are reuniting the Islamic world under their Khilafah uh, until they started getting weak later. So during that period, uh, do you want to comment on the influence of that on the Arabic identity before we go deep into the Ottoman uh, rule? Sure, yeah. I mean, for all Arabs, I think the tradition itself, uh, um, fiqh itself, concerns Muslims more than Christians, of course, by nature, like Islamic jurisprudence. But this tradition of hadith influenced uh, both. Um, so you have the most idealized period in Islam, which is Khulafa al Rashidun, or the rightly guided caliphs, which includes the first four caliphs. During that time, of course, there was a huge split that happened, um, which created two major uh, traditions in Islam itself, which I think, in, in my mind, turned Islam into truly a world religion because uh, it, it spread eastward through Iran, uh, Persians became Muslims, and Islam, of course, like uh, the great religions, all great religions, accommodated or uh, people's lifestyles and traditions. So I didn't see too much contradiction of, you know, being who they are and still being Muslims. Whereas the nucleus of the Umayyad dynasty uh, was centered in Damascus. It became very powerful. So Sunnis were more numerous than Shia. Um, so, and then you have a Shia tradition which took hold in Kufa, in Iraq. Uh, so beyond the rightly guided caliphs, you have this Umayyad period, which was uh, phenomenally successful, centered in Damascus, which gave way. That was Arabocentric, by the way. So it's controlled by Arabs, and, and the, the leadership are all Arabs and in Damascus. Um, that gave way to the Abbasid period. Also, uh, you know, Arabic caliphs uh, who paid attention to cultivating a new leadership from different races who are not Arabs, like Albanians, what have you. Um, so that was centered in Baghdad, so 750 to about 850 or so, a Maya period, and then the Abbasids from that uh, date until 
the area was destroyed by the Mongols in 1254 uh, AD, 50-something AD. Um, you had libraries. Within 100 years of the message, as you mentioned, you have huge libraries from Baghdad to Syria to the oldest university in the world, Al-Azhar, to Cordoba and Granada and North, North Africa and Morocco. So Cordoba and Granada were the Umayyads also had a satellite kingdom which lasted until the age of explorations. I think the Spanish Inquisition actually. Uh, of course, the Arabs were in the Iberian Peninsula as early as 711 AD. Uh, you have libraries there in Baghdad that had um, 300 to 700,000 volumes on paper, which is unheard of, I think, during the period. Um, so the Arabs, of course, spread all the way to the borders of China. And it's, I think it's safe to assume that we learned the technology of making paper from the Chinese. So uh, during the Umayyad and Abbasid period, very early on in Islam, scholars um, who can translate, and many of those were Christian and Jews and Armenians for that matter, they worked in houses of wisdom, as they were called, Beyut al-Hikmah, all over, you know, geographic Syria and Baghdad, <coughs> translating the Greek classics, the Iliads, Socrates, Plato. Uh, if it weren't for them, we wouldn't even know who Socrates is, because those are the works that were later on translated into um, Latin and, and subsequently other languages. Uh, so we lost a huge wealth of world knowledge when the libraries of Baghdad were destroyed by the Mongols. So what became what came after that was uh, sort of a chaotic period which made room for different kingdoms that arose. So the Mongols themselves um, became Muslims, and one of the descendants of Genghis Khan is Tamerlane, for example. And those uh, uh, Turkmen basically took Islam into the Indian subcontinent. That's why you have the Mughal dynasty, you have the Taj Mahal, and contri amazing contributions towards civilization. Um, and some of those Turkmen, as a matter of fact, spread westward to fill that void that was created in the wake of you know Mongol invasion. That was the, the nucleus as early as I'd say 1880, uh, 1280s, for what became the Turkish Ottoman Empire. So that took root in uh, the westernmost part of modern-day Turkey, in um, near today's Istanbul, which became a very important trading post connecting, you know, the Far East with Europe, which made them very wealthy. You don't have navigation to go around, you know, the Horn of Africa at the time. You don't have uh, a way around the Middle East. So all the trading took place through the Middle East. I'd like to stop and backtrack for a second, go back to the early period of Islam, even a few years before Islam. So uh, what little written about was, uh, you know, the Arabs of who became Muslims before, during, and shortly after the spread of the Islamic message in Mecca, from Mecca and Medina, uh, is precious little, especially in Western text. So what you have, again, is a language that is sophisticated enough to accommodate the libraries that were in Alexandria by Alexander the Great. Uh, what you also have is a very, very important trading center which created the concentration of wealth and power, sophistication, with a cultural narrative before, during, and after Islam in that area, Western Saudi Arabia. You have Arabs who had international relations with the African continent and as far east as Indonesia and elsewhere. So we're not talking about a few Bedouins running around who became Muslims and then Spread. No, we're talking about a people who filled a cultural void because they amassed a lot of wealth. And that, you know, differential in the wealth is what bothered the Prophet and the Quran 
came to redress those inequities in people's lives, for example. But what made Islam a timely message and facilitated its diffusion, first northward to Syria, is a huge war between the, the Zoroastrians in the east, or Sassanid dynasty, and the Christian Byzantine Empire in the west, centered in Constantinople. And that war was brutal. People were overtaxed, they were killed en masse very often. It was like a world war in the region. So when Islam uh, spread northward, it was welcomed with open arms. So Muslims were invited and welcomed into Jerusalem, um, contrary to you know uh, popular beliefs, which are very wrong about Islam spreading by the edge of the sword. Not not quite true at all. Yes, there were conflicts, and yes, conflicts are very uh, brutal. But the custom was in antiquity is that if one tribe um, subdues another tribe, all the men are killed. In fact, uh, no one is, hardly anyone is spared. What Islam did when it spread into that chaos of that huge war between the Sassanid and the Byzantine Empire is that it created new rules. It gave sanction to Jews and Christians as people of the book. They paid a poll tax, but they did not have to serve in the army, for example. And that poll tax was not static. It was taken off later on. In any case, they were left as is, as people of the book. Uh, So people were not killed systematically because they belonged to a different tribe. Uh, That should be mentioned. Uh, So that brings us to the Ottoman Empire with the spread of Islam. Um, So the the Abbasid dynasty declined. Uh, That chaos basically created an opening for the Ottomans who usurped Islam. So Orhan, uh, basically Osman and his sons Orhan, and then forget what the other uh, son's name is, began to spread the word of Islam on their own as if they are the guardians of Islam. So that was the beginnings of the Ottoman Empire as we know it. And it spread eastward where the wealth was before it spread westward on the European side. So there was Rumeli or a huge, a good sizable section of Eastern Europe was under Ottoman rule. In fact, they, um, at some point, they reached the gates of Vienna, westward. And eastward, the realm uh, was checked by the Persians, basically, when in, at the borders of uh, Iran and Iraq today, uh, in fact. Mm-hmm. And they spread southward to Al-Hijaz, or western Saudi Arabia. So it included Iraq, all of geographic Syria, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and Egypt. And parts of North Africa, it was like an ebb and flow that reached the borders of uh, Morocco. That was the Ottoman Empire, which lasted uh, until World War I. And the Ottomans uh, caught a big break when they beat the Fatimids, I think, in 1517 by using gunpowder, cannons. And they spread their influence into Egypt. That, That marked the early modern period. Yes, so thank you, Doctor, for this uh, uh, journey over <laughs> a thousand years. Um, just a comment about the, the, the early Islam moving forward is that uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Islam particularly has uh, done to the, to the Arabic culture, quote-unquote, is that most of the characteristics of the Arabic culture were kind of Islamicized. They were adopted by Islam, uh, brought into Islam, maybe a little bit uh, they used to say. They, it was edited and uh, formatted to fit into Islam, but it was adapted into Islam. For example, the generosity that was a cultural habit of Arabs was adopted by Islam as an Islamic uh, good trait, although it was refined from the Arabic uh, exaggerated that uh, trait and other uh, traits uh, um, uh, 
القاء النفس في التهلك throwing yourself into what you believe in ده تعصب للقبيلة ده how do you say this in English? Asbaya actually is a big theory in sociology Asbaya is like uh, tribal affiliation Mm-hmm. So that tribal affiliation was converted into Islamic affiliation to more loyalty, religious, to yeah, loyalty to, into, to religion instead of loyalty to the tribe. Although the Prophet um, and early Islam struggled with uh, breaking this tribal mentality, um, it remains a question whether it actually succeeded in doing so or not, given that uh, one tribe has ruled for the next uh, few hundred years. Uh, but... Um, uh, So when a Muslim started moving, an Arab started moving as a Muslim at that time with, uh, with uh, um, having all his characters becoming Islamic characters. And when a person con- converts from a different culture, he or she also starts having these similar traits that Islam now is teaching. And this is where there was an intermix between Arab as a culture and Arabic so that you have that uh, uh, non originally non Arabic uh, person now learning and speaking Arabic uh, taking some of these characteristics because they are uh, exported by Islam and uh, pretty much uh, they become they you can call them Arabs and Many of the Arabs of today, they have, you know, backgrounds, Turkish backgrounds, Persian backgrounds, Indian backgrounds, all kinds of different uh, backgrounds. Which brings the question of how do you define Mm -hmm. an Arab person now uh, coming to the end of the Ottoman uh, Empire rule where Islamic uh, rule has fallen down, the Islamic identity started to fall down. And uh, after... Over uh, uh, what a thousand, uh, uh, about thirteen uh, hundred. Uh, what is it? How many years? Uh, about uh, we're talking about about thirteen hundred years of of Islamic rule. Now you're shedding that layer and you're going back to the Arabic layer. What is left of it, and how do you define it after that? Well, I don't think. I mean. Arabism predates Islam, but Islam subsumed Arabism. And I don't think they were mutually exclusive for uh, for even a moment. They were never. Despite the fact that the Ottomans, who are Turkmen, who are Turkish speakers, they ruled over um, much of the Arab world, as we know it today, uh, minus Yemen and the uh, Arabian Peninsula, the interior, um, they failed in Turkifying Arab society. They tried. Believe me, they did. And many Arabs, in fact, some of the early immigrants, spoke Turkish, along with Greek, because they went to Greek seminaries. They knew survival English at a minimum because of the American schools there. Uh, And they spoke a little French in addition to Arabic. Um, Many of them did. But Arab identity itself, the fact that they spoke Arabic and they remembered al-mu'allaqat, as we call them, the hanging poets, which are predate Islam and post-Islamic poetry, which is extremely rich period. I mean, you have mystics that the West is studying. We're talking about Abyssin or Ibn Sina, Averroes, Ibn Rushd, uh, Al-Ghazali. We're talking about you know, the father of modern anthropology or sociology, um, Al-Jahaz, Al-Jahab, Al-Jahaz. Um, those are studied, Al-Ma'arri, for example, Abu Al-Ala Al-Ma'arri, Al-Ma'arri, or Al-Mutanabbi. Uh, Westerners study those uh, personalities very, very carefully. All these are Muslim scholars who gave the world, many inventions and advances in all fields, astronomy, astrology, um, astronomy, I should say, uh, medicine, uh, algebra, Jabir bin Hayyad is the father of algebra. They gave the world the numerals, the, the principle of the zero, uh, based on you know uh, Indian practices, but they wrote it down on paper. So you don't have to use you know Roman numerals, which are 
almost impossible to work with when it comes to multiplications, etc., etc. So, uh, the numerals we use in English today are Arabic numerals. That's what they're called, Arabic numerals, on the clock, or wherever you find them. So, that was done in the name, not in the name of uh, religion, not in the name of a specific culture, but the people who were um, contributors um, that made the, the Industrial Revolution even possible were very often Muslims or Arabs. And those terms are not mutually exclusive. You can find among them many Jews. You can find Al, Al Fasi actually mentored a Jewish mystic in, in, um, in Spain and uh, North Africa. So you can find Christians, uh, Kurds. You might even find an Armenian uh, who did translations and authored his, you know, became an important scholar in his own right. So it was a fluid space that was ruled by majority, overwhelming majority of Muslims, but where other scholars of monotheistic faiths practiced. In the East, you have the Yazidis and some Zoroastrians who survive to this day, and they're neither Christian or Muslim or Jewish, for example. They're loosely connected to Islam, um, who are allowed to exist. In fact, more of them were killed after the chaos of the, uh, in Iraq, you know, after the American invasion of that country and what happened in Syria than any other period before that, uh, we think. So, as fluid as the situation is, you still have a functioning identity as Arabs and Muslims. Um, so, you're, you're an Arab, regardless of your religion. Uh, you're a Muslim, regardless of your um, linguistic background. So, you have an, a Muslim realm, which subsumed an Arabic, Arabic realm. But you can draw the line, culturally speaking, between Iraq and Iran, for example. Iraq remains an Arab country, predominantly at least, whereas Iran is uh, Persian. Predominantly. Uh, predominantly, yes. Mm. Uh, the same with the borders between Syria, for that matter, northern Iraq, uh, with Turkey. So the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, speak Turkish. They're, they're not Arabs. They don't have to be Arabs, but they are Muslims. So the commonalities between them and Syrian Muslims are huge. Uh, there's a lot of influence. I mean, the, the Turks, before they declined, they contributed to the region's uh, uh, advancement and in all fields, uh, administration especially. Um, in fact, the Arabs themselves borrowed a great deal from the Zoroastrians or the Persians in terms of administrative techniques, how to keep archives, things like that. Uh, the word archives in Arabic word. Right, as early as Umar ibn Khattab. Yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah. Um, so you have an Arab identity that is functioning, that is cohesive within a Muslim realm. Yet you have a worldwide Islamic identity also that adheres to no single language uh, except the language of the Quran. And of course, that was explicated and explained and um, taught in the local language, in Persian, in Turkish, uh, and every language on the planet, just about. I hope that kind of addresses what you're getting at. Right. Uh, so it, it brings us to the question of this episode. And we are uh, running out of time from, for this episode. But it, it brings us into uh, this concluding sense. So we're, we are at the decline of the uh, Turkish Empire. We are at uh, 19, between 1900 and 1905, and uh, now there is an emergence of um, the, the Arabic uh, identity. How do you define the Arabic person today? Well, who do you consider an, an Arabic person? How does a person know that they are an, an Arabic person? You're referring to a period called Al Nahda which is Renaissance or Arab cultural and political aware, awakening, Al-Nahda. And it's, it's important to backtrack a little bit to the start of the 19th century to demarcate that. So 
Let me ask you, how much time do we have? Okay. So, um, uh, let's actually try to wrap up this episode. Okay. And then we will restart at this point uh, with the next episode. Um, uh, talking about, uh, I think you're going to start with colonialism. Correct? Even before. Okay. What, so, what we might do next time is start with what is called Ottoman uh, Tanzimat or reforms and capitulations, which is economic treaties with the West. That is the time when the West began to gain the upper hand. So the resurgence of Arab identity as a national cultural identity was commensurate with the decline of the Ottoman uh, period. That's what we'll start with the next episode. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Hani Bawardi. And uh, dear listeners, if you have any questions or would like to contribute, to the uh, conversation uh, you'd like us to highlight or shed the light on some of the specific topics please feel free to leave us uh, comments uh, thank you and have a great evening or day whenever you have heard this episode thank you doctor pleasure